my goal is to help you live with more passion, love with more purpose, and lead an overcoming life. One of the things that happens to me almost every day of my life is that I pray with people, whether it's in the grocery store or with family. It's just something that has been a call on my life since I was a young person. And sometimes as I'm praying with people, I can see in their eyes that they wish that I would be a deliverer for them, that I could just pray and deliver them from all sorts of painful, toxic things that they've gone on. And you know, Jesus is a deliverer, and Jesus does instantaneously heal. And yet he's given us, as human beings, choice. And he's given us a blueprint in the word of God of how to walk out the mercies of God in our lives in real practical ways. And so I want to do a two-part series here where I talk about the practical aspect of renewing your mind so that if you are prayed for on Sunday and you have a rush of endorphins and believe that God has healed you and set you free, but on Tuesday you're struggling again, this becomes both the Word of God and the practical step-by-step -step process of how you can renew your mind and maintain the victory that has been won. So when we talk about renewing our mind, let's talk about Romans 12. And Romans 12 is set in the context is that from chapter 1 through 11, Paul, the apostle, has been setting out the doctrine of the church, of what Jesus Christ has done for us, that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, that all of us need Jesus as our Savior. And then he transitions in 12.1 to be the practical of how to walk out and receive fully what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So let me just read from uh, Romans 12.1 and 2 from the New King James Version. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I beseech you, this phrase reminds us that Paul is appealing to our will. God calls us to make a choice about the way that we live for him. He's standing at the roadside beckoning you. Therefore, brethren, it's Paul's pattern to begin a, le a letter with that strong doctrinal section and then to follow it with exhortations of how to live the Christian life. And Paul is begging us as Christians to walk in the way of light and to walk out what God's done for us. And when Paul uses this pattern, Paul is saying that the Christian life is dependent on the beginning, the foundations of everything that Jesus has done for us, the person of Jesus encountering Jesus. When he says, by the mercies of God, he's reminding us it's because of the mercy that has been shown to us by God that we are only able to offer ourselves to God as he works his mercy in us. God commanded us to do this, and he makes it possible for us to obey him. Think about all the things he's done for us that were talked about in Romans 1 through 11, that he 
completely justified us, the penalty of sin, that he I, adopted us and put us in the family of Jesus Christ, that he placed us under grace and not under the law, that he gave us the Holy Spirit to live within, that he promises that help in every time of affliction, that he's given us an assurance of standing in God's election, that there's a confidence of the coming glory of God. There's a confidence of no more separation from the love of God, that there's a confidence in God's continued faithfulness. All of these concepts have been taught in Romans 1 through 11. And now Paul is talking about the practical, that in the light of all this mercy, past, present, and future, Paul begs us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. To present our bodies is connected with the idea of a living sacrifice. This calls to mind that priestly service, spiritually seeking, our bodies are brought to God's altar. It's best to see that our body really represents us bringing our entire being to God. Now, a living sacrifice would be known by the first century people because both Jews and pagans knew firsthand what a sacrifice was all about. To beg that they make themselves a living sacrifice was a very striking image to their minds. The sacrifice is living because it's brought to the altar alive. <laughs> the sacrifice is living because it stays alive at the altar and it's ongoing. You know, this part of, of being a living sacrifice, that can happen throughout our lifetimes. You know, sometimes when people are, are wanting me to pray for them, I can feel this pull that they want a one and done. They want to end this struggle. But the reality is while we're on this life, there are times of struggle. But as we learn to renew our minds, it gets easier because we're constantly abiding with Jesus and his refreshment is coming to us. I do believe it becomes easier to overcome challenges because there's been a pathway of habits built in how we think. You know, so if you did not grow up with good godly examples, which by the way, most of us have not to some degree. There's been dysfunction, there's been hurt, there's been pain, there's been trauma. So there's almost got to be a rewiring of your brain. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But I want you to realize that this is an ongoing process. You know, I, I remember a good friend of mine and just a shout out to Tony Klein. And Tony and I were both associate pastors. And in many ways, we were stewarding revival. God was just moving in such a way. And we were, you know, it was a long time that we were on friends and uh, that we were friends and on, on pastoral team together. But different times, Tony and I knew each other well enough that sometimes in the midst of a difficult situation, Tony would lean over and whisper, do you smell that? That's my flesh burning. And we, we knew, I knew exactly what she meant because sometimes you're in the midst of things and you're dying in the moment. It's you are a living sacrifice. There are things that you go through that internally are difficult. And every time you go through that difficult situation, you can literally become a burning sacrifice. Part of becoming a burning one is that you're dying to yourself. You're picking up your cross daily. And that is a part of the process that we all go through. And, and as Paul talked about becoming holy, acceptable to God. You know, when we offer our body, God intends us to be holy and acceptable sacrifice. And the standard for sacrifices made to God under the new covenant are not any less than the standard under the old covenant. 
God has made us holy. He's commanded us to be holy and to resist the conformity of the world and to embrace the transformation in Jesus Christ. To not be conformed to this world because we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's so that we can prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. When you think about being conformed to this world, that word there, conformed, comes from the Greek word, suskin, <laughs> I'm not going to pronounce it well, suskimetso. And you get the word in the English level language of schematic. And one thing that has helped me with this is to think about the fact that the world has a schematic for the life. Uh, uh, the devil has a plan for your life. And it's that your life conform to the worldly values, that you follow his scheme, his schematic, his plan. You know, the enemy has been watching your family for a long time. There are generational sins that sometimes you don't know about it, but a familiar spirit has been assigned to your family and that thing has to be broken off of you. That you've got to be not no longer conforming to the pattern even of your ancestral sin. That Jesus came to forgive give and cleanse you of that iniquity of that ancestral things that were passed down through the bloodlines. In essence, you have a new bloodline and Jesus, his shed blood is your bloodline. That means all sorts of things. That means attitudinal things, but that also means your physical reality that Jesus is your healer. So when we do not conform to the pattern of this world, it, we're being warned, there's a world system, this popular culture, this manner of thinking that is in rebellion against God. And it will try to conform you, fit you into that box that you must resist. And we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is the opposite of conforming to the world because you've been called to stand out, to be transformed. This is the ancient Greek word metamorpho, which describes a metamorphosis. The same word is used to describe Jesus in his transfiguration. This is a glorious transformation. And the only other place that Paul uses this word for transform is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And he says this, but we with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. For Paul, this transformation and the renewing of our minds takes place as we behold the face of God, as we spend time in his glory, we are transformed. And, you know, it calls back to Paul is also looking back to Moses, that when Moses went inside the tent of meeting, literally his face would shine because he had come in to the place of God. You know, as we encounter him and oh my goodness, I have been a part of encounter nights at Upper Room this week and it has been glorious this transformation that happens when you come in to the presence of God with a community of faith. And part of what happens is that that same way that Moses would go into the tent of meeting and then his face would shine and they'd, they'd put a covering over him because they, he didn't want the, the people to see the fading glory. Well, that's the old covenant. Here, Paul is pointing to the new covenant of walking with Jesus. And think about it. When you have been in God's presence, literally 
the glory of God reflects on your eyes and your actions and your, your face because he's just so good. And that becomes, as you keep the embers of revival firing up in your life, you can walk into the grocery store and the person behind the line looks at you and says, are you a Christian? Can you pray for me about this? Or you're in a line and somebody comes and asks you for wisdom or help just because they could sense that you walked in wisdom. You know, when the glory of God is in you, you become a people magnet. Even if they don't know your name, they don't know your past, what you've done, you become a people magnet for those that want to walk with Jesus. And then you just became a sign that you just point people to Jesus. And as we prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God, as we are transformed on the inside, the proof is evident outside. As others can see what the good and acceptable, perfect will of God is through our life. Paul here explains how to live out the will of God. Now keep in mind the rich mercy of God to you, past present and future by the mercies of God. It's because of his mercy. And as an intelligent act of worship, decide to yield your entire self to him. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And you're going to, in walking this out, resist conformity to the thoughts and actions of this world. You're not to be conformed to this world. And by focusing on God's word and fellowshipping with him, you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me read Romans 12, 1 and 2 from the Passion Translation. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? to surrender yourself to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop in imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Well, Healing Rain community, I want to encourage you, this is possible. You know, if you are stuck in stinking thinking, you can get out of it. <laughs> That phrase is from my mom, who's 84 years old. And I remember at one point when I was going through the initial learning how to renew my mind, and we were pastoring and, and we went through some sort of upset. I can't remember what it was. So my mom was my prayer warrior and, and still is. And I remember calling her and, and talking about um, some of the internal world because of what had happened. And, 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 you know, she's a pretty saucy, practical woman. And, and I, I just can still hear her saying in my mind, Sue, you're in, you're stuck in stinking thinking and you gotta get out of it. <laughs> There's a choice that we have to renew our minds. And tomorrow I want you to join me because I want to break this down in a very practical five-step process um, that I think you're going to really value. So as we go today, be encouraged. God's got you. As you renew your mind, day by day, you are going to be a living sacrifice to him. As we close, I want to give you the opportunity to download a guide that I've developed that really it's a simple guide just founded on scripture. I talk a lot in that guide about just my 
internal process of, of walking from through inner healing and deliverance. And this guide is called Five Steps of Grace, and you can download it at suedatweiler.com. Or if you would rather just text a word, you can text the word encouragement to 44222 to get in touch and we'll send you that guide. Blessings on you and hope to see you here tomorrow when we talk about a five-step process of how to renew your mind.